Thank you for joining us today. Today we are going to do another Canyons U Bite Size PD. Um, this time it's going to be on 3D Science Instruction, Best Practices for Elementary Teachers. So I am Cynthia Lloyd. I am the Canyons District Elementary STEM Specialist. So I am in charge of anything with science with K through 5. I am also um, working with the STEM Brain Boosters that are in our elementary schools. So feel free to contact me at any time. This is my email um, and I'm also giving my district phone. So if you ever need any help, um, any support, or if you want to reach out um, to get more information or clarity based on this particular um, Bite Size PD, please feel free to contact me. So the name of our Bite Size PD today is Making Elementary Science Meaningful Through 3D 5Es and literacy integration. We have spent some time within our district over the past couple of years looking at data. Um, we have implemented new programs into our um, ELA block. We have also um, implemented some new things into our math component and now we're starting to really look at the science that we have um, also implemented over the past few years. So, professional development norms today, as you're listening to these slides um, and to me kind of give you an overview of what three-dimensional science looks like in our district, I want you to take the time to be a learner, um, be focused on improving your student outcomes. We want to do what's best for our students and I want you to think as we're running through all of the different little nuances of science um, instruction within our district, what can I do to make this make science instruction better for my students? How can my students gain mastery? So I want you to um, look at the different professional development norms, be committed, be responsible, be respectful, and be safe. Um, and I just kind of want you to think about which one you might want to focus on today. Okay, now that you've got one of those in mind, um, keep that in the forefront of your thoughts as we're going through the different pieces of science instruction. So our agenda for today is that we are going to look at the Canyons District Elementary Science Proficiency data first. We're going to look at science best practices, in particular why and how do we teach to meet student needs. We are going to delve into three-dimensional instruction in the five E's. We're going to look at backwards design, um, starting with the three-dimensional assessments, other resources that are found in your Utah Core Guides, and then other district resources. So when we always have to look at our CSD multi-tiered system of supports, our MTSS framework, and today we are going to be focusing on the standards for instruction and evidence-based strategies. So our learning intentions and success criteria, the learning intention is I am learning how 3D science, the five E's of science instruction, and the Utah Science Core Guide support me in successfully planning and embedding best practices in science instruction. The success criteria today, how you'll know once you're done going through this PD and looking at the resources. How you'll know if you've been successful is I'll know I've learned it when I can identify and explain how to design my instruction to support student proficiency. So I just kind of want you to look at um, last year's RISE elementary comparison. Our fourth and fifth graders are the ones who take the RISE test. What do you notice? What do you wonder? Okay, if you need more time to look at the graphs, I want you definitely to pause the video for a moment. But let's kind of look at what we see in the data. So on the right, I want to start with a graph that is on the right. Um, the blue is all of our schools in the district. Um, that's not just elementary schools, it's elementary, middle, and high schools. And then the red is just the elementary schools in the district. So obviously we didn't take the test, um, the RISE test in 2019-20, 
Um, that was a COVID year and we did not administer the test at all, so we do not have data for that. Um, you can see that our elementary schools, they are slightly below the average for our middle and high schools. Um, that can be for a bunch of different reasons. We did implement a new um, Inspire Science and we have been implementing new core that has um, the curriculum for the K through two that we have implemented that is district written. Um, we also obviously had COVID in here. So you can see though that although the elementary, middle and high kind of stayed the same, we had just a slightly um, big, not big, but a slightly percentage points went from 53% to 57%. So a 4% um, is not bad, but if we look at the um, data table on the left, you can see that that 59% um, and then that 57% for elementary schools doesn't look so great on the left. We still have some work to do, especially with our um, populations like special ed students, our low income, our Hispanic, and definitely our multilingual learners. Um, as we try to increase their proficiency levels. So overall, as a district, our science instruction um, is not bad, but there are different things we can do to improve. So we're going to talk about some of those things today. Okay, this is one of my favorite books. It's called Ambitious Science Teaching. Um, it is a really good read, so if you're interested in um, getting a hold of a copy. It's very, um, you can find it on Amazon. So it's a very good book that kind of talks about how to get our students to learn to learn. Okay, so I'm going to read it to you. Changing students' thinking requires that they actively engage in sense making. Some of this is done individually and some has to be done by peers. In either case, it involves making connections between ideas. Remember that part interpreting experiences with material or data for the purpose of understanding real world events and trying out academic language as a way to express what they are learning. So our students need to be able to speak and have math, mathematical, mathematical and scientific discourse um, by using the academic language with science. They need to be able to make those strong connections between ideas and our core, um, our Utah science standards, they help us make those connections um, through uh, cross-cutting concepts that we will learn about in just a few minutes. And we want to do all this for them to have the purpose of understanding real-world events. Our science curriculum, the Utah SEED Standards, is specifically written um, and implemented for our, our students to be able to look at the environment around them, look at the phenomena that they see in their everyday lives, and they need to be able to think critically to try to understand and problem solve around those real world events. To continue reading, it says developing new knowledge, however, is not the only goal. We want students to be able to identify their gaps in understanding and the resources or experiences they need to learn more. We want students to select and deploy sense making strategies for themselves without depending exclusively on us to direct their every move. We refer to all of this as learning how to learn. Our goal as science teachers in Canyons District in our elementary school is learning, teaching students how to learn. We want them to be able to do investigations, to be able to think critically, to be able to ask questions without depending on us as teachers. We are no longer a sit and get science where we are just teaching them concepts and having them memorize um, and maybe doing a little step-by-step -step procedure or lab to go along with that. We need to get our students doing hands-on learning, to read informational text, to watch videos, to look at the phenomena by going outside and investigating their world, putting all of that together to think critically, to understand the world that they live in. And we need to teach them how to do that without us. In today's age, um, we, our students can pretty much, and we can too, look up anything we want on the internet. Um, we can find those, look, for just for example, if we're looking at clouds outside, we can look up what type of cloud is that. Um, it's more important that our students learn how to learn, 
and how to find information and how to use that information, how to collect data, how to, after it's gathered, how to put it into tables to organize it, how to analyze it, um, to be able to answer questions and to be able to find solutions and build models. Okay, this quote is from our Utah Seed Standards. It says, just as science is an active endeavor, students best learn science by engaging in it. This includes gathering information through observations, reasoning, and communicating with others. It is not enough for students to read about or watch science from a distance. Learners must become active participants in forming their ideas and engaging in scientific practice. So if you think about your learners in your classroom and the ones that you've had previously and the ones that are going to come, how are learners active participants in science class? in your classroom. If you need more time answering this question, I want you to pause the video because I would love for you to come up with um, just some ideas on your own, maybe jot down a few. Um, on a piece of paper and um, kind of think through that process before you listen to my explanation of this. Um, this is not all inclusive. However, the sentence up there that says this includes gathering information through observations, reasoning, and communicating with others. Our students are active participants by doing science. It is them writing, reading, speaking, listening, sharing their ideas, using academic language to help make sense of what they are doing, participating in hands-on learning experiences that are not step-by-step, -step, but are models that they have planned um, the process of going through and making the model of them possibly looking at that model and trying it out and actually seeing if it's working um, or if they need to go back in and tweak and, and redo and make it even better. So this is all how our students are learning. I hear quite often sometimes that um, some teachers feel like our students are doing way too much reading and writing during science. Um, that is not the case. They need to be doing more reading and writing in science. That's how they share their ideas. That's how you as a teacher can look at their, their thought processes and it's how you can identify whether or not your students are really mastering the concepts, whether they can apply it to real world applications. So we're going to look at some science best practices, and I want you to understand why we teach science the way we do, and then how we are going to teach it. So many of you had had letter tra letters training, and we have a Scarborough reading rope that is a part of that training that you learned about. This is something that has been around for a little while. Um, Dr. Hollis Scarborough kind of came up with this rope to show that we need all of the pieces and parts together for reading um, and for literacy in order for our students to be able to um, learn to read and also comprehend. So this reading rope consists of lower and upper strands. It has the word recognition strands, like your phonological awareness, your decoding, your sight recognition, um, and familiar words. And these work together as the reader becomes accurate, fluent, and increasingly automatic with repetition and practice. We also concurrently have the language comprehension strand, which is background knowledge, vocabulary, language structures, verbal reasoning, and literacy knowledge. They reinforce one another, and then they weave together with the word recognition strands to produce a skilled reader. This doesn't happen overnight though. It requires instruction and practice over time. For many children, we know that learning to read is a challenging undertaking, and it takes all of these strands, all of these little pieces together to form a cohesive, strong rope for our students to have the ability to become literate in every subject, not just in ELA, but in math, in science, in art. Um, we do literacy skills, the same literacy skills in every single sub of those subject areas. 
So I want you to take a look at that rope and I want you to compare it to the one on the right, which is our three-dimensional science rope. So we have three things. They are called the science and engineering practices, the cross-cutting concepts, and the disciplinary core ideas. These are your performance expectations when they're all wrapped up together. And just like our literacy rope, we know that we have to have all three of these pieces together to build that strong foundation of instruction so that our students can become um, literate or have science literacy and master the skills that we need them to in our science. So these three dimensions, the disciplinary core ideas, the cross-cutting concepts, and science and engineering practices are what we're going to focus on for just a few minutes. I have an example of third grade. Um, I'll get, show you where the core guides are in a, in a moment and you can look at the standards, but this is just an example. Our disciplinary core ideas are, um, in this case, balanced and unbalanced forces on the motion of an object. That's what our students are going to learn about. The cross-cutting concepts are effects. They're, the cross-cutting concepts are what build those strong connections. If you'll remember that quote I said, making connections, um, the cross-cutting concepts help us build those strong connections from background knowledge and from when they learn about the different disciplinary core ideas and they can extend that knowledge to another um, similar disciplinary core idea in either later in the year for students or in subsequent years. The science and engineering practices, those along with our math practice standards are how we do science. So the disciplinary core ideas are how we, what we learn. The cross-cutting concepts are how we build and make those connections. And the science and engineering practices are how we learn the science. So this is in your um, core guide and it's also in the standards, um, the Utah Seed Standards, which the core guide is just taking the seed standards and we have kind of taken them and broken them down so that they're easier for teachers to understand. Um, the, our state has done a great job of doing this. These particular um, three strands, the science and engineering practice, the cross-cutting concepts, and the disciplinary core ideas are the exact same from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade. They do not change. So I want you to take a look at this for a moment and I want you to find something you notice and something that you wonder. Okay, go ahead and pause the video if you need more time to look over these. So with the science and engineering practices, the part that's in bold, I want you to know that when we have, when I show you an example um, of an actual standard, the bold words are always the science and engineering practices. They're going to come first. That is the most important part of our um, science with our instructional practices, how we teach, is that we are giving those kids those hands-on learning experiences. Um, developing the models, planning and carrying out investigations, and so on. The cross-cutting concepts, they are exactly the same also from kindergarten through 12th grade. Our kindergartners start with patterns. They start looking at patterns with weather, um, and then they moved into different things that they see with living, um, living organisms and trying to look at the patterns that they see. Then they go into cross-cutting concepts of cause and effect. Our kindergarten students are using that academic language with their teachers. And so by the time they get to higher grades in elementary school, like third, fourth, and fifth, your students should already understand what these terms are. They are really important that you use these with students. Um, even little kindergartners can say the words cause and effect and use that academic language as they're explaining something. The cross-cutting concepts in the standards are always underlined. Then we have the disciplinary core ideas, and it's really hard to see from this slide, but these are the parts that are italicized in the text. It's what the concepts that we're teaching students. Um, it's the way that when I was younger, I did science just through the disciplinary core ideas. Um, it was prior to the Utah Seed Standards coming out um, and the national standards changing with the 
with a different core. So I was taught mostly this for my core ideas, which is, was a lot of memorization, not a lot of application. We're now making connections and we're having those deeper applications. Okay, so this is an example from second to third grade. Um, I do want you to pause this for just a moment, and then I want you to look at what similarities and differences do you see between the second grade standards for properties of matter and the third grade for force affects motion. Hey, hopefully you've had a chance to look this over. Um, some of the things that teachers have pointed out in professional developments that I have done as they've looked over these is that they have like patterns in both. Um, they have cause in the second grade, but when it gets to the third grade, they have cause and effect. It's not because the students haven't had the effect part yet, because I told you that kindergarten students do cause and effect. Um, but if you look at these deeper, they are literally um, kind of progressing from grade to grade, just like our math progresses, where we may learn a concept in second grade, we build on that in third grade, and then we bring new learning and we attach it to that. So the same progressions happen in our science. Okay, I also want you to then go from third to fourth grade. Once again, just pause the video and I want you to look at similarities and differences that you see. Okay, so we have for our science and engineering practices, um, on the left we're in third grade, we're planning and carrying out investigations. That also is in standard 4.2.3 for fourth grade. In third grade, we're starting to analyze and interpret data. Um, we are constructing an explanation in both of them. You'll see though for standard 3.3.5, we're designing a solution. Whereas in 4.2.4, .4, we're designing a device that we can use to be able to then look and find solutions. So they change just a little bit, but the core concepts, um, they grow on each other and progress. The science and engineering practices are the same. We just get a little bit more complicated and more complex from year to year. Our cross-cutting concepts, how students are making those connections, they are the same. So you need to use that academic language with your students. And if you say to them, oh, cause and effect, what did you learn in science last year with cause and effect? Hopefully they'll be able to bring up some of the examples um, and some of the ideas that they learned in third grade or in your, in case um, you're teaching fifth grade, your fourth graders, um, when they were in fourth grade, they should be able to, to use that background knowledge from the year before then to build and make those connections to what you're doing in the classroom now by using those cross-cutting concepts. So what comes next? Now that we have our 3D science instruction, we understand the three pieces, um, the three parts of good science instruction um, to make those performance expectations in our classroom of what our students are doing. We're gonna look now at how we do that. So our district, and um, there are other models that are out there, but this is the one that we feel is the best for students. Um, and the one that is driving our instruction um, here in our district. It's called the 5e e storyline model. Now we always start with an engaging phenomena. It can be a picture, it can be a video, it can be um, an experiment that you're doing in the front of the classroom so that your students can see it. Um, it's something that we want to start and engage our students learning about the concepts um, and the applications for this for particular units. So I know too many times there are programs out there where we still have teachers that think, okay, I've, I've just now shown them this phenomena. Now we're going to have a discussion about why it's happening. I want you to hold off on that because our students should be looking at the learning experiences that come next and they should be gathering evidence um, that they can use to support their idea of a phenomena and at the end of a unit, they should be able to explain that phenomena based on the, the what they gathered through the learning experiences. So our learning experiences 
um, they can be explore, explain, exp and expand. They don't have to have all three. You may have a learning experience that is just explain. There could be one that's just as explore. And if you're, if you've gone through quite a few learning experiences already and you want to expand your ideas with students to maybe have them transfer their knowledge to a new situation or a, like an extension for some students, that can also be there. So a good unit should have at least three learning experiences to support the phenomena. Four is even better, but within those three or four learning experiences, one should definitely always be informational text. Um, that is something that should not be kind of put to the side in a unit because our students need to be able to read the informational text um, and use the same ELA strategies that they're using in their wonders program and in their ELA block um, to look at the ideas and to be able to transfer that. So when we're done at the end of a unit, after we've started with that phenomena, had those learning experiences and circle back around, we have an ending phenomena. So we put it all together and we look at the original phenomena and students should be able to explain. But when we go to assess our students on the end, we want to do a higher DOK level and a true three dimensional assessment by having them transfer what they learned to a new phenomena a new situation and you're going to know whether or not your students have those deeper understandings if they can take what they've learned and apply it into a new situation so um just go kind of talking about the informational text right now this is just a very simple one um that I just want to bring in, if you want more ideas and information with informational text and how to incorporate it into your science classroom, um, I'm hoping to do a future bite-sized PD about this, but please feel free to reach out to me. So we have shared reads, we have little readers, um, we have lots of text that we're reading in our ELA block in our Wonders program. Um, a lot of teachers think that it needs to be lined up exactly where we have the wonders we're reading at the same time and then we're doing the science that same week um, or throughout that same unit and that's not always best practices and i want to explain why so sometimes we can um, like have a pre-read where we are reading about it in wonders and then by the time we get to that science unit you can refer back and say students remember when we read this story in wonders Think about what that has to do with what we're learning about now. So it's like introducing your students and getting them prepared. You can also go back and look at the informational text. So if you've already taught something in science, a unit, and it comes back up again in wonders, that is a spiral review for you. You can have the students then engage in the text that they're reading, the stories or the informational text and they can get a spiral review and every time you do that that builds deeper connections in your student's brain so we do have fictional reads that we um, are looking at with our students and we also have informational text so the problem with informational text in kindergarten and even through part way through our middle school all the way up to seventh and eighth grade um, is we have taken sentences that were more complex and we split them apart um, to make them shorter sentences. We do that so that our students can, can look at the, um, the meaning behind what's happening within the sentence structures. But when we break those sentences apart, a lot of times with informational text in science, we take apart that connecting word in the middle. Words like because, or, um, and, and when we take those pieces out, sometimes we lose those deeper connections. So as you're teaching the informational text to your students, make sure you have pre-read it and you can build those back in through talking about um, exactly what the sentences, the meanings are. And if, it, the, if it's not in there and it's not apparent to students that this is happening because you need to make those cause and effect um, inferences with your students you need to bring that in and have some um, discourse with them about that. So if we look at the different texts, I want you to pause this video and I want you to think about how you could teach um, and how you could instruct your students. What strategies could you use to embed them in these texts and um, give them deeper understanding into the concepts you're learning in science?
Okay, hopefully you found some good connections and some good ideas. Um, I want to talk and just read one more quote with science li disciplinary literacy. This is in um, our instructional guides. So it says, disciplinary literacy instruction seeks to turn the students into a scientist who is not just simply reading and writing about science topics, but instead is producing written texts and materials from the perspective and experiences of a scientist. Research has shown that when early elementary teachers use disciplinary literacy strategies, for example, reading, speaking, listening, writing like a scientist, students' vocabulary increases in both science content and literacy text structures. When reading, speaking, listening, and writing are aligned with science practices and integrated within the science content, students are more effective at producing science informational text that is more like a scientist and not just writing about science topics. Please do not give up on your students. Even kindergartners, if they don't know how to make and form their letters yet, if they cannot write simple words, model for them. Have them draw a picture. Um, if you've ever heard a picture is worth a thousand words, have them draw a picture and then tell them to ask you or ask them, um, what, does, what does that picture mean? Tell me about it. That is still part of our literacy. Um, modeling with students and having them copy what you're writing is, a, is excellent for students to start learning how to write like a scientist. Okay, so when we're planning units, we always start with the backward design or the 3D assessments. I want you to know that there are other materials within McGraw-Hill that some of you don't know about yet, but I want to kind of let you know that they're there. This is an example of a three-dimensional, um, deeper, higher DOK level assessment. So for third through fifth in McGraw-Hill, I want you to search three-dimensional assessment guide and you're going to find a PDF. Some of you can use the word three, some of you can use the word T-H-R-E-E. -E. Sometimes there's a dash, sometimes there's a not. So try um, any of those particular um, little different scenarios. It's not the same in third, fourth, and fifth. I can get onto a third grade platform and it will be, I'll find it a different way than I can the fourth and the fifth. So I can't give you a definite way to find it, but just try those different um, little nuances that I just told you about. But once you find it, you have a document that will come up that has got exemplars in it and it definitely has higher DOK assessments that some of you I know have been asking for um, that you can use with your students. I would never just give this to students without first modeling. So the first time you ever look at one of these with your students, I would model by going through it with them. Um, make your thinking visible to students. Um, and then after you've done that one or two times, give have them try it, have them see. Um, it You'll know a lot better than doing a, just a multiple choice, just a plain multiple choice test, what your students know, what they don't know how they can apply it, and how deep those applications are. So if you need help with those, please contact me and I will help you find them. Um, they are a great resource that you can use, not just for a summative assessment, but also for a formative. It can be used if you need a center activity for your students to be able to work on, and they definitely can be used for extensions for students who need just a little bit more. Um, in the K through two, we have built um, these three-dimensional assessments already into our student science notebooks. Um, so just know that they are already there for you. Um, they are definitely built around that. The McGraw-Hill and Science platform though, they do have a lot of just plain multiple choice that are definitely DOK level, sometimes of one and, and maybe a little two. They do not have the deeper assessments. We want you using these deeper assessment pieces. Um, again, they can be used for formative, summative, reteaching, spiral reviews, and extensions. So they are a great resource for you. So other resources that we have that I want you to know about are, um, some of them are found in something called our OER textbooks, and some of them are found in our core guide. So down here at the bottom, the OER textbooks, I have given you a link. Um, this shows a third grade one, but they are for all of your grades, K through five. 
Um, and then this the science core guide, this is showing just the cover for the third grade one, but if you click on this link, it is taking you into um, the Utah core guide and you can get into the different resources that I'm going to show you. So I want you to take you to the OER textbooks first. So if you scroll down, you will see the different pieces of text here. So the kindergarten, the first and the second, your workbooks that you have and your presentation slides that were district created were built around these. They don't use everything from here, um, but I want you to see that this is a resource that you can get different informational text and different phenomena with your students. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click on the fourth grade one. And this takes us to the OER textbook. If I view the resource, at the top, you'll see that there are kind of instructions about what the Utah, the, the core guide is. Um, and then it takes you down into phenomena and it also takes you down into looking at um, different ways of assessing and some informational text. So this is for chapter one, organisms functioning in their environment. We start out with a, a beautiful piece of informational text and a beautiful picture here that your students can look at. Here's our phenomena. It might be different than what you have in your McGraw-Hill. So it is another way that you can get students into um, being able to apply their knowledge to a different phenomena. But definitely some informational text. There are always questions that you can ask and focus questions. Um, that are directly related to higher level thinking with the phenomena. In that, they always have really good informational text pieces with lots of good visuals. And then finally, at the end, it will take you back around to looking at that original phenomena. This is an awful long informational text piece, but it's beautiful reading that can be implemented in your classroom. It always puts it all together so you go back to that very first piece, um, but then it always has a final task that is just a little bit different. Higher level, definitely something that you can build out an assessment that is more three-dimensional. So I wanted you to be aware that this was here. Um, I had some teachers saying, I need more text. Um, I need more examples of phenomena. I need ideas for assessments. Just know that these OER textbooks can give you that. So if we go back, um, to our core guide, there's something in the core guide that I also want to show you. So I would highly suggest that you come down here and you find your grade level and when you have that, that you bookmark it because it's something that you'll want to get back into. I'm going to go ahead and show you, let's do fifth grade this time. So every single one of your standards within fifth grade with the core guide, we have broken these out. I haven't, but people in the state have done a beautiful job, um, committees of breaking these standards down for you so that you, first of all, there's beautiful reading at the top. If you've never read, read, read that part um, of our core guides, it kind of gives you the background of why we're teaching. So when you get to a standard though, and I'm gonna to go to the very first one, standard 5.1, characteristics and interactions of our system. The next couple of slides that I'm gonna talk about for each standard, there is the sections that I'm going to show you. But as we're in here, um, I want you to look at this 5.1.1 formative assessment. So if we bring that up, I want you to see that this also is an excellent resource that you can use with your students. The very first part of it kind of has um, the phenomena, the explanation. It gives you the um, the answers, but it also gives you how it relates, um, what DCI it's with, what are our science and engineering practice, and what cross-cutting cross concept that it um, works on within that particular standard. Down at the bottom, once you look at all of those examples, because it also gives you a proficiency scale, how are my students doing with this? This is a great way for you to be able to um, assess how they're how they're doing especially for when you are ready to do your report cards after that it gives you the clean pages that you can give to students um, that this is what they see so we have a map of an earthquake um, a mountain range map earthquakes in california it gives a task it gives questions just another resource that you have that you can use with your students so i wanted you to be aware that both of those were there So when we're looking at 
um, the parts of the Utah Core Guide. These are the sections in there that I was um, referencing. So it would be a great idea if you could have your um, Utah Core Guide opened up so that you can find these as I'm talking about them. So one of the questions we ask ourselves when we're developing units, um, especially even with Inspire Science, there is not a perfect program out there and teachers should have agility to be able to know what their students need and to be able to fill in holes if you find that there are, if you need to bring in different resources for your students. So one of the things that is at in each section for every single standard is this part where it says, what does it look like to demonstrate proficiency on this standard? This is what your you and your PLC should be looking at when you kind of think of your rubrics that you're making for your assessments. Um, I believe very strongly in rubrics being made by PLCs and not necessarily by me at the district level um, because you guys know your students best. You know what your expectations are based on what you've been teaching. Um, this is a great resource for you to be able to look at to be able to um, make those decisions. Also, something that is new as of last June to our standards um, that are now in our core guides is there are authentic cross-curricular connections. So this is a beautiful resource for you as an elementary teacher because I hear all the time that some teachers, um, when they're doing their reporting on their report cards, maybe they only looked at one little thing in ELA and you didn't have enough time because um, you just started that, but you're having to report on it in um, on a report card in a re in a peer in a reporting period. Also with the math, you may have just have touched on it, but these authentic connections, these if you look at the ELA, um, the those standards, and if you look at the math standards during this particular unit when you're talking about this particular standard, um, this is what should be here. So this is obviously for third grade, um, and you can use these as pieces of evidence that you can report on. One other thing that I want you to, to look at is when you're teaching the unit, you should be touching on all of these. So your students should be speaking clearly and audibly. They should ask and answer questions. They should write informative explanatory pieces. They should conduct short research projects. Um, with math, they should be using appropriate tools strategically. They should be measuring and estimating liquid volumes and massive objects and so on. So you can also look at your units and make sure that these are something that um, is built into the units that you're teaching. So they have also have a beautiful thing called a 3D instructional planning table. Um, this kind of walks you through the, the different pieces, the science and engineering practices, the cross-cutting concepts, and the disciplinary core ideas. Um, those are the three pieces that make up the three-dimensional. So these are the things that students should be able to identify. Um, notice over here, it says with guidance, planning and conducting an investigation in collaboration with peers. Um, this is evaluating different ways of observing and are measuring a phenomena to determine which way can answer a question, making observations firsthand or from media, making predictions. These are all the science and engineering practices during this particular um, unit, the standard that should be taught. Down here at the end too, um, the Utah Core Guide um, also gives you other possible phenomena that you can use to support your 3D instruction. So those are other little pieces that you can bring in to enrich um, your students in, in deeper applications. Okay, so based on all of that um, that I've given you, I know that's a lot, especially if you haven't um, been had a PLC PD with me or um, haven't had a lot of um, background knowledge on this yourself, I want you to be aware of some things that are coming up um, within our district. So I have a third through fifth grade science leads team right now that's working on unit presentation slides. So all of you teachers who are teaching McGraw Hill Inspire, um, they're building presentation slides so that you, instead of getting into the platform, because sometimes it's a little bit clunky and hard to get around, um, and sometimes you're like, oh, I wanted to show this video, but now I can't find it. And it's been five minutes and you're trying to still show it to students. Um, they will all be embedded into the unit presentation slides. There will also be additional resources in there, optional STEM projects that you can do in addition to the ones that are already in 
um, our units, um, different extensions, differentiation, spiral reviews. They definitely will have three-dimensional assessments built in um, and some of those strong career connections that we need our students also to have um, the background. The student informational text and the workbook pages will also be built in to the presentation slides so that when you're having students look at their notebooks, um, you're not having to go from a presentation to a notebook, presentation to a notebook. It'll be all built in there into the same slides that you can refer to. Um, for K through second, um, this year you might have started to notice that there are arts integrations being put into there. Um, I'm hoping to expand on that. Um, for the third through fifth, that will happen eventually also. Um, but for K through second, there will also be optional STEM projects and extensions that you'll start to see in there um, for next year. Some of you, have, this is the first year you've been teaching um, these particular units, but you'll notice that there will always be um, stuff that's added to it. Also for K through second, I want you to know that um, you will have vocabulary cards like your counterparts in third through fifth next year. Um, they will be sent to your school at the beginning of the year um, for you to better use so that you have can have a science word wall within your classroom. So if there are other things that you need, um, other resources, other help, other supports that you need, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I am, I am more than willing and very happy when teachers do that so that I can help them improve their their work um, at the elementary school in science. So with that, um, I want you to think, and I will really want you to put this, this video on hold for just a moment, and I want you to write down what is something you learned today that you can commit as an elementary science teacher to dive deeper into and explore. What are you going to commit it? Okay, now that you have that written down, don't try to go alone. You've got good PLCs out there in your schools. Um, rely on each other as a teacher um, to help build each other, help support one another in your work with science. So thank you for watching this PD and for learning a little bit more about how we do and how we teach three-dimensional science, the whys and the how of how we do it, getting into our Utah Core Guide, um, and also looking at our OER textbooks and hopefully the three-dimensional assessments that are found in the Inspire Science will also be a good resource for you. Once again, if you need anything, any support, um, please reach out and I will get back to you just as soon as I can. My information again is found on um, one, of the, one of the first slides that we did um, and I would love to hear from you.